Now, here's everything that can go wrong for the pianist. piano has been drinking my necktie is asleep and the metronome ran off to roam the g key had to take a leak and the curtain needs a haircut and the spotlight looks like a prison break and all in hall is ten below my First to ice, you know the piano has been drinking. The piano has been drinking. The piano has been drinking. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. As Didi says to Gogo in Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, that's mankind all over for you, blaming on his boots the faults of his feet. <laughs> in the two stories just presented, each is an example of someone confused about the cause of their woes and therefore placing blame on the wrong, superficial things. Tom Waits's piano player, or the classically bastardized version that I just attempted, is of particular interest to us. You see, we all have a musician, an artist in us. Some can express themselves with enviable skill and ease. Others, however, can be held back by mental, educational, and physical chains that weigh them down, and you'll never hear of them. What can go wrong for the pianist? There's a lot, I know quite personally. Early on in my life, it was clear that I had a talent for playing piano, and I loved it. Later, and somewhat unrelatedly, I discovered another talent that I had, which was for mathematics. So the story I want to tell you now was created in the intersection of these, my two great loves. Once I realized, oh my god, you can bring them together. <laughs> Scientists have studied musicianship, but not in ways that are very meaningfully helpful to musicians. And nowadays, musicians also do try to use some kind of technology in their performances sometimes. But it's often quite superficial in the way that it's done. However, what I want you to take away from this talk is that we are on the cusp of much more meaningful interaction, a deeper intersection between these fields that could be very helpful and very interesting for both music and math, and which I personally find really, really exciting. So from an early age, I was on this fast track of becoming this competition-worthy uh, young virtuoso pianist. And when I started studying at university in Vienna at age 11, I remember this, I remember it too well, it's kind of sad actually looking back, my, my professor said, with such surety, Hannah, when you're 16, you will win the Chopin competition. Translating classical music law, the Chopin competition is the piano equivalent of the Super Bowl, I guess. Um, five years later, I turned 16, and guess what? I hadn't won the Chopin competition. I hadn't looked into the Chopin competition. I hadn't even applied to the Chopin competition. Life had taken a turn in a different direction for me, and I was a bit lost. Piano became something that became torturous for me at times, and performing was this huge struggle. From a very early age, I was pushed to play more and more difficult music. What I didn't understand at the time was that not only was my brain not ready, but my body 
was not ready. I didn't understand the physical mechanics of what I was doing nearly enough at the time. It was like my body was rebelling against me. I'd get these physical ills, like sort of expected ones, I guess. My elbow would hurt, or I'd get cold fingers before performing. But also, I'd get these terrible stomach aches, and I'd feel nauseous, I'd have to throw up and get fevers if I just practiced too much. I was struggling, I was lost. I was looking for something to give me purpose and clarity, and, and for this quest, I ran away from home, <laughs> leaving not just my family, but the country, the continent, and my piano for a year. It was horrible. I, I hated it. I, I hated being away from the piano. I still remember whenever I heard any kind of piano performance on the radio or wherever, at that time, I'd just start crying. And I realized that I wasn't, that I couldn't really, that I wasn't willing to leave behind what had been my dream for most of my life at that point, classical music, classical piano. But to continue, I had to change something because it wasn't sustainable. I'm not alone in this. Many pianists suffer from a lot of maladies. Everything from tendinitis, tendinosis, nerve damage, golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, all sorts of elbows, the list really goes on. It's a confusing landscape to navigate if you're a student and it can be really lonely. But I had very supportive parents and they really took me around to the best professors in the world who specialized in some school of postural, some med medical profession specifically for musicians. My plan wasn't sustainable, but I was so certain that it could be because there are pianists who play beautifully, professionally, without any physical issues way into old age. They all play in very different ways, I guess, at least superficially. You have Rubinstein, here playing a Chopin Polonaise, who goes like this, very majestic posture, straight-backed, rounded fingers, large, arched gestures. And then you have someone like Horowitz playing the same piece, here, who has these straight, spidery fingers, stays fully at the keys, minimal body movement. Lots of differences. But they shared some trait that I couldn't quite put into words. A tension, a fluidity, a lightness, an ease. I studied them, I mimicked them, and it unfailingly made me feel better when I copied their movements. Suddenly, I'd be able to express my own musicality just by changing the way I physically moved, changing what had become my own natural, unlearned way of moving at the piano, which had been giving me all these troubles. So, of course, there are schools and theories of piano playing, but they can conflict in very confusing ways if you're a student. And perhaps they don't have to. And so I came to college, to gain a background in science. I mean, if you want to create a scientific basics for music education, you probably need some more education in science. So I enrolled to study mathematics and piano at the conservatory. And I did quite fall in love with math just for itself. I did a bunch of math research and just dived into the math world at first. But as I studied math and also physics and computer science, I always kept an eye on how I might use them to look for how musicians can master their instrument with as little injury as possible, with as much organic, natural simplicity, simplicity as they possibly can. The first hurdle was the data. At piano, many important things happen at millimeter scales. It's significantly more difficult to gather data that's precise and detailed enough than in sports, for example, where scientific studies of athlete movement for athlete training is well established. At piano, you'll do a small movement and you'll do it repetitively for many weeks and many months before you actually get injured. And then it's hard to trace back what actually caused that. 
So the first thing I had to do was gather data. I got two GoPro cameras, nine pianist friends and professors who I bribed with chocolate to play the set list of pieces for me. I set the cameras up like this, as you see here, that's me. Um, and I pieced those two-dimensional videos together into a three-dimensional reconstruction. It wasn't very good. My camera footage was too low resolution. My frame rate was too slow. My reconstruction too uncertain. But it was a first attempt. I went to Harvard, and I went to this neuroscience lab where a cutting-edge software for Markerless Pose Estimation had been developed to work on the pianist data there with them. But still, the data quality was just not quite high enough for the analysis that I wanted to work very well. But I did have a research scientist who believed in me at MIT. And so I got this study together. And I went to MIT to work with the Immersion Lab. And Dr. Praneeth Limbori, who's long been interested in the study of human movement and has been exploring that for a while now. And it was, it was super exciting. We had amazing computers, these huge monitor screens. We had this 28 camera industry-leading precision motion capture system. <laughs> uh, we had EMG sensors, heart sensors, uh, ultrasound probes, just all the fancy technology I could have only dreamed of using to capture the human body. So here I was, given the opportunity to lead the study of my dreams. And lo and behold, it turned into this very odd thing. This is not your traditional Carnegie Hall concert. This was people who came in and took off their clothes. It wasn't a burlesque show either, though. This is going to make you traditional purist pianists sit up in your seats a little straighter. But what I had to do with these pianists was we had to take off their shirts in order to put over a hundred devices and markers on their skin. Imagine playing the piano with all these sensors on you. How weird and cool is that? Um, I'll show you a clip here. a lot of data, an absurd amount of data. In fact, we captured the most extensive and detailed rendering of piano playing in history. And uh, let me show you an, an initial observation, I guess. If we're looking at the electromyography data here, uh, you can see these little larger bumps, these impulses given by the piece. And these impulses are present across many muscle groups simultaneously, from left biceps to right lower spine. But for somebody who has often been injured from piano playing in the past, the results are a bit different. These same impulses will appear much more localized, clear only in one or two of the recorded muscles. There's a sense that maybe healthy playing is more global holistically integrated across the body. Now, we're just at the start of discovering what this and many other patterns in the data are and what they could mean for the future of people who play their instruments. If you go to a conference on mathematics and computing and music, you'll notice that there's been little interest, and I don't quite understand why, from the mathematical and scientific community on the physical movement of musicians. So we're changing that now. And it's really important too, because since that video that I just showed you was posted a month or so ago, over four million people saw it. And I was surprised by this huge outpouring of interest, even from some of the world's most prominent pianists, that came in the form of comments, emails, messages, from across the world of people saying, thank you so much, you know, this is so interesting. I have an injury, I'm, I'm a musician, I'm kind of stuck at home right now, I can't perform. Really, 
waiting for what you find, really looking forward to reading your results. And it was translated with commentary to Russian and Spanish and German and Chinese and Korean, etc. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, but this shows me that there is definitely an interest and a need from the musical community for this kind of work. And we have to build a new mathematical toolset towards the capability to address it. The study of human movement at the peak of its abilities is a marvel to behold that is still largely mysterious. What do I mean by mathematical toolset? Let me show you an example of something relatively easy to explain. Um, that kind of applies here in principle. There's this algorithm for facial recognition that was made in the 1990s, so really old by facial recognition standards. And you take thousands of images of faces and you find the 30 principal components, eigenfaces, that capture the most significant variation across all these images. That creepy looking ghost face at the bottom is an example of an eigenface. And it turns out that if you take only 30 eigenfaces, you can reconstruct recognizably millions of people's faces just by linear combinations of, of these eigenfaces. That's a very small amount of components to be able to reconstruct millions of faces recognizably, right? There's, it's like there's this very large simplification that does a great job at differentiating between people. So imagine something similar to that for movement. The same principle applies of taking something extremely complex, looking for patterns in that, and breaking it down to simple components. What if you could take the data from great healthy pianists and boil them down to find some eigen moves that define their playing and compare that perhaps to people who have injuries? Could this form the basis of an objective school of piano playing that could maybe help people avoid injuries more efficiently? Maybe. I hope so. And if we can do it for piano, we can do it for any other instruments too. Really, what I want you to take away from all this is how very exciting it is to be able to mix the arts in a very fundamental way with the sciences as we have the possibilities to do in this day and age. To help the arts, to help the artist. In something as human as the movement of musicianship. Thank you.